I enjoy solving problems. So when I talk to students today, I tell them if you if you like to solve a problem, I mean, it, you get a kick out of getting that answer and drawing a circle around it. Uh, engineering might be for you. That was me. So I, I like to solve problems. So and I was a good student, uh, but enjoyed math and science uh, the most. So engineering seemed like a good fit uh, for that. And I also like chemistry. Um, so I chose chemical engineering. And Georgia Tech was in my backyard having um, completed high school in Atlanta. So it was a natural choice uh, for me to go to Georgia Tech. And uh, my path to NASA was not a typical one. I wasn't like always dreamed of working for NASA or always dreamed wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I had met my first husband while I was at Georgia Tech and he had co-opt with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. So I was headed to Huntsville and uh, there aren't many chemical plants in Huntsville. So um, I was fortunate enough to also be hired into Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, had that not happened, I probably would have ended up in the oil and gas industry, which at the time was hiring a lot of chemical engineers, maybe ended up in Houston. Um, so I was really fortunate. I got in at NASA and um, initially into the propulsion group, but only spent about a year there and found my way to a fledgling life support group, which had just been given the responsibility for uh, the, the space station job way back uh, in, in the mid 80s. So it was a really good fit for my chemical engineering because life support systems are chemical processes. And so uh, I really enjoyed that and uh, enjoyed uh, starting working on the space station way back in the beginning. It sure is an exciting time. I, I just came from the flight readiness review for our next crew launch to the space station and we'll be launching next week. Uh, so we, it, it's a really busy time, really exciting time for NASA um, and, uh, and our international partners. Not only are uh, more countries interested in space, but more private uh, interest is coming from the, the private sector, commercial space uh, as well. Uh, one of the key missions for the International Space Station is to be a test bed where we can learn about the systems um, and about the effects on the human body uh, that we will need to do these future missions beyond low Earth orbit. So things like the life support systems, but also the effects of weightlessness on the human body over long periods of time. And we need to develop those technologies and do that human research so that we know how to keep crews healthy as for the missions to the moon and Mars. So the ISS is a really critical testbed platform. Um, and how's it changing over time? Gosh, we are entering our third decade on ISS. Our first decade was all about assembly, which we completed in uh, 2011. And then the last decade, was really learning how to use and expand those capabilities on the space station to do research. And now, especially now that we have our commercial crew vehicles flying, we're really maximizing the full potential of the space station. Uh, so we have more crew, that means we can do more research. We have more um, partners participating, both international and commercial. And so all that adds up to really maximizing its full potential. Yeah, our international partnership is the reason the ISS has been so successful. 
we're even we are uh, seeing more and more interest in in other countries, not just our our regular partners, but other countries and nations wanting to participate and even fly their own astronauts. Uh, so that's a great opportunity. Um, it's it's also a challenge uh, because you know we have limited flight opportunities, uh, even with more vehicles and limited space on the space station to do things, um, but. Um, I think as we and other countries expand our commercial capabilities, there will be more opportunities. So one of the areas we are seeing uh, pr uh, promising markets for in tourism uh, are these flying astronauts from countries, from sovereign nations. And we think that's going to be a promising market for um, our, these private companies that want to um, to do have pr platforms in low Earth orbit and and uh, and do activities. So I think uh, it's a challenge, but also an opportunity. Our vision for a low Earth orbit economy is hopefully multiple human or human tended, commercially owned and operated platforms. Uh, one day we will retire the space station. It won't last forever. Um, and we, but we don't want a gap in low Earth orbit and human space flight. So we are doing all we can to enable a future where we have privately owned and operated platforms where NASA can purchase services and, and other countries and entities can as well uh, for what we still need to do in low Earth orbit. And so we call it, we want to be one of many customers. Um, so we, um, with the growing number of uh, commercial LEO satellites and constellations, it does increase our efforts to ensure there's no interference with the space station. We work that closely with uh, the FAA and those providers when they're going to be doing their launches to ensure that you know we stay out of each other's way. And, and uh, we have had to do some avoidance maneuvers occasionally to avoid uh, some objects, uh, but that's pretty rare. Uh, so um, yeah, so, so far so good. Well, I would say it's a great time to be starting a career in space. Um, and there's lots of paths to take, not just the traditional STEM, don't have to be an engineer. Uh, don't get me wrong, I like being an engineer, but there are all kinds of, of careers in the space business. Um, and, uh, and not just with NASA, but exciting opportunities with our uh, commercial space providers as well. So when I started, there were very few women in leadership positions. That landscape has definitely changed. And um, when I started working on the space station, I never imagined one day I'd become the director. So my journey has had a lot of twists and turns. Um, and I said yes to opportunities and jobs when they were offered. And those things led to the next thing. You know, I would say um, don't try to to, um, to to start with the perfect job or map the perfect career. Just take take an opportunity and and look for ways to contribute and find your niche and and let it lead you to the next thing. So um, pretty much everyone I've talked to is has not climbed the ladder straight up. It's more of a jungle gym. Um, and like I like me, I started out in propulsion, um, and that wasn't really for me. And found my way to uh, the life support system area, which I made a career on. So I would say just being open to that, and but look for look for that first opportunity, and and uh, and go from there. It has been a challenge, boy. 
Um, initially, our on-site work was restricted, so some projects were, especially the non-critical projects, were delayed because uh, we couldn't bring people on site to do the, the hands-on work. Um, critical projects have been remarkably successful, though. Uh, the teams have found a way to, um, to, to safely continue to execute. I know at Mission Control, there are multiple Mission Control rooms, and they work from one and clean the next one and, and do shifts that way. And, and um, so we've made it work, and uh, we've kept uh, this, had to keep the space station flying and, and all of those activities. Uh, so the team has really risen to the challenge. Now that uh, the vaccine's available and people are really starting to get vaccinated, um, I think uh, things will get easier. Some of our centers are going op opening to the next stage and allowing more people on site. So we'll, we'll start to see things hopefully uh, get back to a little bit more normal. I, I would love to, sure, uh, but I'm also happy at this point to, to enable others to go. I think um, at this point in my career, I'm probably destined to stay on the ground. <laughs> We've got a whole cadre of, of younger, uh, younger astronauts. So developing life support systems in space, like I said, it's a, it's a lot of chemical processes that we use, and it's a combination of liquids and gases and solids, which, uh, as you can imagine, in microgravity uh, behave differently together. So phase separation is more difficult. Um, I'll give you one example. Uh, we process urine into drinking water. And, um, you might imagine if you were to do that on the ground, it would be a fairly simple process. You're, you're distilling urine, you're boiling a pot of urine on the stove <laughs> and uh, the steam rises and you collect the purified water and the, the solid is left behind. Well, in microgravity, the way we do it, we still boil urine, but we have to do it in a rotating centrifugal, use centrifugal force to rotate it so it it slings the liquid to the outside walls where it's evaporated and then we suck the condensate, you know, the steam away. So everything is more complicated. Um, but, um, but we recycle uh, over 90% of the water. We're getting close to not recycling 98% of the water. And on the carbon dioxide that we remove from the air, we are able to recover uh, about half of the oxygen back from the, so recycle about half of the air, and we're working on technologies to, to go farther than that. Um, you mentioned the effect on the human body. We're doing a lot of research um, on ways to counter the effects of weightlessness. Uh, exercise is a, is a very important countermeasure, we call it. So the crew has to exercise a couple hours a day just to uh, counter those effects of, of a long-term weightlessness. But we've gotten pretty good at, um, at how to do that. You, you, you do notice when they land, they need help getting out of the spacecraft. So you can imagine a mission to, um, to Mars where they're in space for six months or longer and then nobody's there to help them get out of the spacecraft. They're gonna have to get themselves out. So we have a ways to go to figure out um, ways to, to make that work. But, um, but the space station is a wonderful test bed for learning. We know that no one country can do everything by themselves. If we're gonna explore space, we need to do it together. And that's been very important to us. And so our partnerships are very critical um, so groups like the ITU, um, not only do you provide uh, collaboration opportunities, but uh, develop these important interoperability standards. And we've developed other, other interoperability standards so that 
uh, different countries can bring contributions and we know that they'll plug and play together. And um, I think that's really important to enable um, everyone to participate and it also drives uh, in the global uh, commercial partnerships as well. Um, so I think it's a very important role.